I am so proud to be co-hosting with Be Red and Shiny tonight. I got a whole team on my side, including Leah Triplett, who's going to be moderating our discussion. Um, Gertrude's is actually just usually a big circle too, and it's rare that we have panelists. But as we started thinking about doing this um, topic, there just were so many interesting points of conversation. So many new people around town who seem to be working in different areas of arts writing, like new platforms for art, all kinds of things. We decided to try to be a little more organized, uh, put together two panels related and hopefully, hopefully sort of building on each other. So one tonight and one on May 17th, and to actually invite a few people to be spokespeople um, but this is supposed to be very conversational. I think there are lots of people sitting here tonight who have also wealth of expertise that I hope you'll share and questions. It's supposed to be conversational. Thank you guys all so much for doing the self-introductions. I found coming to these events myself that it's really, really helpful to just um, to get everyone start to start talking right from the beginning. And, being on the other side of, of this event now, it's really it's really helpful um, to hear why everyone is here and what they're involved in. Um, as Randy mentioned, I mean, I really feel like so many of you in the audience could be um, up here with us. So hopefully, we'll have a really um, informal conversation about arts training in the city. Um, so, as Sharon mentioned, I'm Leanne Triple Harrington. I'm the senior editor of uh, Bigger and Shiny. And I'm also a founding editor of The Rib, which is a recently launched publication platform. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Not quite. No, okay. I'm a little bit of a low talker, so sorry. Um, so uh, I'm really excited to have this panel here tonight to, I think we, all of you really represent different um, and really vital aspects of our arts ecosystem here in Boston. So I'm actually going to have you guys do the same thing that we just had the audience do, which is self-introduce yourselves really quickly, like one sentence. Uh, my name is Juan Ovaldo, I'm an artist and I'm also a professor at MassArt. I lived most of my life in my hometown of Bogota, Colombia, and I arrived in Boston almost three years ago, two and a half years ago. I'm Jamie Lee Lacey, I'm the director and curator of Providence College Galleries. Um, I am a sometimes writer for Art in America, and I also recently moved to New England from Chicago. Uh, where I lived off and on for a little more than a decade. I'm Kate McQuaid. I'm an art critic for the Boston Globe. Um, I guess that's all. <laughs> I have a lot more than that, and actually I want to say I'm really excited to be around, surrounded by all these, so many people who write about art. I, I, I'm not used to that. <laughs> My name is Jameson. I am the founder and editor-in-chief of Boston Art Review. Um, well, yeah, as, I, as we kind of mentioned, um, I'm excited to have you guys all represent, representing so many different facets of our arts ecosystem. Um, uh, I joined Bigger and Shiny five years ago as an editor, actually five years ago this April, um, but really writing was my entree into Boston. Um, I moved here back in 2010 and actually started writing for Bigger and Shiny almost immediately as a way to really um, engage artists working in the city and also kind of understand uh, why they were working in the city and, and what that um, what that context was like. Um, and I've always really been fascinated with, with criticism because I really do think it's, a, it's especially um, now there's a lot of accessibility and there's a lot of elasticity there um, to think about contemporary art in a way that maybe more academic writing doesn't allow. Um, so, since this conversation was billed as a way to um, define art writing, I wanted to kind of start with a soft introduction or a soft uh, definition of arts criticism. Um, hopefully, we can kind of um, expand on that and build on it. Um, I'm also hoping to frame this discussion a little bit around um, more towards community and how um, criticism can build community, and also how the craft of criticism can build community. So with that in mind, I took this definition from um, Lisa Crossman, who I'm so excited is here tonight. Uh, she wrote a great um, essay for us back in 2016, um, right after the um, Boston Creates Cultural Plan was released, which I'm sure a lot of you remember. Um, and we were really thinking at the time 
uh, about how to elevate arts criticism into the Boston Creates conversation um, and how to ensure that um, more voices were heard in the future of the uh, cultural life in the city. So Lisa's uh, definition for that essay, which you can read in full um, on bigroomshiny.org, um, but her definition of arts criticism is uh, writing that offers a sophisticated assessment of art and the experience of it, placing the work within a, within a frame of reference that is informative and thoughtful. Art criticism is valuable in that it provides regular readers with language and background information to be repurposed as tools to articulate readers and viewers' judgment of art. Um, so hopefully that's a helpful way to get into the conversation and you can expand and comment on that. Um, so with that in mind, my first question is for Juan. Um, so Juan, as Shane mentioned, has an excellent show up now at the distillery called Full Collabs, and it's up through April 12th? 11th. 11th, okay, so you should check that out if you haven't yet. Um, but Juan, I feel like a lot of your work a lot of your work uses language and writing um, and investigates systems of information. So I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, how, what the relationship was is between your work and writing and how you feel like criticism either clarifies or obscures your work. Sure. Um, well, and it was interesting when I was thinking about this panel because uh, reading and writing, the, the act of reading art criticism for us in Colombia was uh, almost like a natural context for learning art. Mm -hmm. And being in a country that doesn't have the access, especially before the internet when I was starting my undergraduate studies and even before undergraduate studies in high school when I got, I got very interested in contemporary art. Uh, the only access that you had to the main discourse of contemporary art mm -hmm. was through magazines and books. And on top of that, it was like, now that you mentioned like obscurity and clarity, it was obscured by the fact that everything was in English and mm -hmm. we all had to like somehow translate and get read. So, but that translation becomes investment and that investment becomes uh, at some point a, a type of like creative capital that you're accumulating that you sometimes are unaware of. Like you mentioned something here that my work deals with systems of information and maybe it's because of that, because I really had to become really immersed in these systems and it was something that I could not ignore because it was my own my only entry, not only mine, but my community entry to art uh, in general, to assess the art, you know, like many uh, works of art we would only see in photographs that were like this big, yeah. you know, so uh, text became this incredible kind of like common ground for a bunch of like my generations to talk about art in a global context. I think the generation before mine in Colombia was uh, really preoccupied with very like kind of like localist issues and issues that were really relevant only to the Colombian cultural art context. And I think because of the strong efforts of globalization by the United States and in general the whole like. Uh, uh, Western uh, Hemisphere and um, kind of like pushed us to the point that we needed to somehow access mm -hmm. art and the only way was through really delving into these books, so for example, I don't know, discovering something like Relational Aesthetics by Nicolas Muriel that was translated from the French to the English and then us translating it ourselves with our precarious methods be be became kind of like an exercise, like again a community exercise that was always complemented by getting together and, and, and growing up and having either discussions within the school or outside the school that were all around the writing of art more than art itself because right. the art because the writing became our bridge mm -hmm. to that so um, I think to this point I'm, I'm very interested like right now that I'm part of an academic institution as mass art and then I'm, then my work has become more international because of my travels and stuff um, it's, 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 I still think a lot about those two words that you mentioned, uh, obscurity and clarity. And I love that, uh, this sounds counterintuitive, especially for somebody that's a professor, but I love art that somehow it obscures a uh, certain type of information in order to reveal other aspects that sometimes are not uh, disclosed 
informal specific writing for other disciplines, you know, like I think I, I, I with my students, for example, I, I, I enjoy have, having them read work, uh, especially read uh, criticism or articles that are willfully obs obscure and difficult, because in that, in that, in that search for clarity, a new meaning starts being produced mm -hmm. in their understanding, in their discussions. So, so I think I think it's really important for a community to have these kind of like points of entry to mm -hmm. to a practice that are not very clear. You know, that that, that leads something to obscurity, something to uh, that is mysterious, that that generates imagination, but at the same time that it's that it's I don't know that's fruitful in order to create mm -hmm. a communal conversation. Yeah, that's really, I mean, I love how you talk about um, the art writing being kind of your bridge into the artwork, because I think I certainly have felt a lot of that um, just throughout my life, feeling like um, I see and experience more art through writing or through images um, in magazines, certainly when I was growing up, than I do actually in real life. Um, so I guess this question could be for really anyone or anyone in the audience, but how do you, um, like really broadly, how how does you know narrative and storytelling play into the writing of criticism? It does. <laughs> um, it, it, I think storytelling is a very powerful format for for uh, a conduit for expressing you know what whatever you're trying to express about art. I mean. I, I think, I, I mean, it's partly that the experience of going to look at art and taking it in is a, there's a, there is, as, as the viewer, there's a transformational art that occurs. Mm -hmm. So as the critic, I'm explaining what my transformational art was. There's a narrative to that. Um, I mean, there's a lot more going on because mm -hmm. there's, there's context and, you know, description and all of that, but I think, I think that that is a really easy way for a writer to connect with a reader by, by making this a, a story about his or her experience of seeing the art. Or, or even if it's not a, my personal experience of what it's like to see the art, there may be some story in the art that needs to be told. Mm -hmm. And I just think storytelling is is crucial. It's not. Oh, it's not always necessary to use, but I think it's a really sexy device for getting something across. And so, what is your process like with writing? Like when you visit, when you walk into an exhibition, like what do you? How do you start thinking about writing about it? I take notes. I take. You know, I walk around. Usually, some Randy will walk me around and tell me everything she has to say about it, and then I will walk around. Mm -hmm. And, and take notes about the things, the works of art that grab me. And, and then I won't, I, and depending on the exhibit, I mean, if there is a catalog, I will read the catalog. Mm -hmm. um, if there's research that needs to be done, I will do the research before I sit down to, to write. And, and if in any of those, you know, reading or looking, um, processes, something really starts to grab my imagination, then that's usually where I start with the writing. Mm -hmm. And then and then the writing takes me where I, wherever I'm going. Yeah. I mean I think it's interesting sometimes I walk into a show and I'm like, I can just write the review, it's all in my head and I can write it immediately and then sometimes if you need so much time to kind of think and reflect and do the research um, that needs to be done. Yes. Do you do the research before you go in, or do you go in and just have the experience and then do the research after? You know, that has changed. Um, it really depends on the show and how much research has to be done. But uh, I was, until like a year ago, doing the research after I saw the show. But, but it, for, in the last year, I've been doing the research, if I can, ahead of time, because I feel like it really bolsters my experience when I see the art. Yeah. Maybe I could just add, um, when I'm working with my editor, um, I started doing pitches, um, not necessarily because you're required to do a pitch, but there is something about the pitch that um, if you're collaborating or talking with someone prior to visiting the exhibition, that person um, 
can say, oh, you know, I saw this show or I saw that show of this artist or that curator. Um, I found this to be really interesting. Could you look out for that? Um, so I found that research beforehand can be really nice because you can start to build a conversation before you get to the exhibition, and then you can determine whether or not you want to finish that conversation. You can also figure out how closely you want to read or look at something versus another thing, um, because I'm sure, as all of you are um, uh, avid art lookers, um, looking at an exhibit really closely is um, overwhelming, even if it's really small. So for me, if I can just have an entry point before I get there, it gives me a little more stamina to look and take notes. I also like to connect narratives. So one thing that I'm really interested in in my writing is connecting, um, you're using intertextual references to create a bigger picture about what's going on. So sometimes even moving beyond the single exhibition at hand and looking at the history of, well, how is this presented at other institutions or other spaces, um, and giving kind of a broader picture that brings in other writers and other perspectives, and perhaps even the artist at hand as well. And I think broadens the story and the experience and the intake as well. Yeah, I think, I mean, just going back to the pitch, um, the pitch perspective, I think that is my like biggest piece of advice for people who ask me how to pitch or how to get started writing is, learn to write a really, really great pitch because it really helps you on both ends. First of all, you get the you get to write the piece, right? But then, for me anyway, when I get stuck writing something um, or stuck reviewing something or whatever it is, I always go back to the pitch that I wrote because it kind of jogs my memory to remember why I thought this exhibition or whatever was so interesting to write about. And then oftentimes, I've also, sometimes I find, if I'm lucky, I've already written something really great in the pitch, so and I'm trying to like, you know, reinvent the wheel by by doing it again. That's if I'm lucky. That doesn't always happen. But, um, but yeah, something, um, Jameson, that you talk about, and I wanted to touch be, touch with talk about with you is that um, I love the voice and style that Boston Art Review has. You guys have a really specific voice already. Um, how do you like? How does uh, voice or how do you define voice, I guess, and then how does voice, um, how is how you're writing about something impacted by what you're writing about? Okay. Yes. First of all, thank you. Um, I think voice is, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to find your voice as a publication and as a writer. And because Boston Art Review is primarily submissions based, um, we're dealing with a lot of voices. So I'm really fortunate to have an incredible editorial team that's really helpful at, at pinpointing like, okay, this is a perspective that we want to dive more into, whereas perhaps this one is not what we're really feeling with this. And I think being open to seeing how a narrative can develop especially in the editing process is really important. So I know like for our team, we actually do spend quite a bit of time in the editing process to kind of nail down that voice. Um, could you repeat the second part of your question? <laughs> I think it was basically, I can't repeat it exactly, um, but I think it was basically like, how do you, if you walked into this exhibition, how would that dictate, how would this exhibition dictate what you're writing about? Ah, certainly. Um, yeah, I think I think your voice is contingent upon what you're experiencing and interacting with. Um, you know, for a show that we have here that's really taking in so many different, there's so many people involved in this, using the internet, using social media handles, for example, might be more appropriate than um, a different kind of exhibition. So I think using the tools at hand and what's presented in the exhibition to help form the voice uh, is going to make a piece stronger and also more accessible or exciting to read for someone who wasn't able to step inside of this room. Um, and maybe this question is for this side of the panel, but um, I'm really curious, you know, uh, I'm really curious especially Jamie Lee, maybe you can answer this, about how how you decide whether you want to curate something, um, like put an object in space versus write about it, um, and one for you too, like how do you know you want to make an object versus do a writing about, about an idea? 
Uh, well, uh, for me, the students is because I, I'm a terrible writer, so <laughs> and, and so so for me, uh, it always comes to the point of like how can I translate or facilitate writing within my work, which primarily deals with either video animation and performance, and and that is obviously informed by writing and by text, but. Uh, talking about voice and, and storytelling. And maybe it's not that I'm such a terrible writer or whatever, but it's just that I, I'm not interested in how like my voice, because I think my voice also comes from that place in which I enjoy obscurity, and, and but I enjoy it for myself. So I, I try to create work in which becomes a platform for writing or for text in a more expanded way of looking at text. So when I was... Uh, listening to Kane and, and, and Jameson, uh, I thought of, of a piece of mine that's called Museum Mixtape, and it's a piece that I did as a commission from the new museum, in which I traveled to the southeastern part of the United States doing hip-hop interventions in l large museum, museum spaces in the southeastern part of, of the country. And it was just a response to how these uh, spaces were like so like sublime but also it's, like super empty mm -hmm. in the last years they have in, have seen an incredible decline in audiences and audience engagement and community engagement and one of my my ideas was to create uh, an intervention in the form of like a hip hop video mm -hmm. that is shot in the museum and that takes the museum as a as a scenario or as a stage in order to craft language or to create a new type of language surrounding art making. And, and that's how I try to like evolve writing in a lot of the projects that I, that I do. I, I try to create a platform in which new forms of, of writing or new forms of text and dialogue can be established and almost as, I don't know, like proxy models for future possible scenarios or just as an artificial creation that only lives within the, the video or the piece. So in that, in that specific project, it was really interesting because I was working with local rappers from different cities uh, where the museums were located. And working with rappers to craft language around art was super amazing. So they were uh, always, at the beginning, our communi in my commu my communi my communication as an artist behind the camera with, our, uh, with a rap artist was always like, okay, should I look at the catalog and write about the catalog? And, and I was always like, no, you do whatever you want, but it's interesting. And for me, it would be more interesting if, we, if you get to write about the first-hand experience yeah. of coming to the space without being informed by the official information. And that totally changed things, you know, like the, the, their own writing became more uh, uh, free and, and and unique and also very like real and original rather than because that the, the try to adapt to the writing that was already uh, promoted by the space so in that sense i think that, that writing just becomes like a space that i like to facilitate but which i'm not in, in total control of mm -hmm. like in this piece i never wanted to like had any input in the lyrics of this mixtape and they were all written by the by the rappers that i was invited to that's interesting because I thought they were more. First of all, I thought they were a little bit more collaborative, and also they're all, they feel the lyrics feel so immediate. Like it mm -hmm. really feels like they're just coming in and rapping about just seeing something for the first time. So, yeah. um, so I'll sort of give my answer in two ways. First is that I often think of curating and writing as going together, and um, as still kind of being an outsider, um, I have found that. New England does not have a robust um, a robust alternative publishing system. So artists here desperately need um, exhibition catalogs. Um, so my priority as a curator, especially if I'm curating a solo show, is to um, do almost everything in my power to get a great catalog, even more so than a great exhibition, because artists Local artists and even sort of um, mid-career artists from all over the world desperately need scholarship written about their work. Um, so I try not to divide the two too very much. Uh, but that said, um, in terms of a bigger picture of arts writing, um, when I'm writing about an artist or an object or an experience that's unrelated to an exhibition, 
um, I, I think about what the writing does that an exhibition can't or that um, you know, a spatial experience can't do. And often, uh, Kate uh, touched on this a little bit, um, I think that's a close read. Um, looking, you can look for a long time and you can be trained to look and you can know what to look for. Um, but I would say that you know, the majority of your audience is not trained to look but they're probably trained to read and to take words for what they actually mean. So that's why we're, you know, getting a re renaissance of arts writing without jargon. Um, so when I'm writing, I really try to dig deep into an artist's um, practice, into their biography. Um, and there's something in arts writing that's not related to the catalog essay um, that you can't do with an exhibition, and that's be critical. Um, I'm sure that a number of you have experienced um, the last 10 years, a lot of arts writing reads like a press release. Um, I'm not, we're living in polarizing times, so I'm not saying that there has to be sort of like this, this intensely negative critique of artists and the work they're doing, but I do think that, they're, that art critics and arts writers um, have an opportunity to make judgments. Um, that's what art criticism is, is describing, analyzing, and judging. So I try to find ways to do that in the writing. Um, I got my start, actually, as a curator. I was working in um, as a curatorial associate um, at a museum in Prague that hadn't yet opened. So I was writing newsletters to donors, sort of describing artworks and putting artwork in a context. and. Donors were writing back and saying, "But you don't own these objects yet. You don't. You know these are artists from the middle, from Middle Europe, Eastern Europe. Um, is it good? Please tell us. Is it good? We know these are newsletters, but we want to know: Is this something we should be spending our time on, collecting, um, building relationships with these artists? Um, and again, who care? You know, we don't necessarily need to care so much about the market." But I do think that we need to sort of use writing to, to do a close read of the work and to build an intellectual value system around art. And I think that writing is the best, um, if not only, way to do that. Yeah. Um, it's interesting you mentioned that we're having a renaissance and kind of jargon-free arts writing. I totally agree. I think it's really exciting. Um, but Kate, I was wondering if you could just give us your thoughts on how you think, I mean, you've been writing for the Globe for 20 years, yeah. so that's amazing. It's crazy. Yeah. It's, um, <laughs> I mean, how has is, how is the critical landscape in Boston changed in that time period? Oh, God. <laughs> you know, what happened was uh, the internet. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> um, I was, there was the Globe, and there was, there was Art New England, and you know, there have always been uh, publications have come and magazines, other magazines have come and gone. Um, but when, you know, Big Red and Shiny came, and it, it just it, it opened up this much larger universe of, of art writing, and it's it's um, it makes it much it makes the arts, the visual art, much more accessible to people who are interested in it, and there's just much more available to read than there than there was 20 years ago, I think. Um, you know, and what, what I'm writing is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and what you're writing is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Which yeah. is, you know, how yeah. it goes. Well, also, I, and people who know me will roll their eyes that I'm mentioning this again, but um, the Phoenix, the Boston Phoenix, which was around, I think, from the 60s until 2013, and Randy used to write for them, I did too. Um, and you did too. Okay, cool. So I, I was looking at some of their archives, which are at Northeastern, um, and, are, and are free open to the public if anyone wants to take a look. But it's incredibly, um, it's amazing to look at some of those old issues of the Phoenix because it's like four sections of almost all reviews, and not just art reviews. It's restaurant reviews, movie reviews, theater reviews, dance reviews, wine reviews, toy reviews, like anything that could be reviewed was reviewed by the Phoenix, it feels like. Um, and it's 
it's daunting to think that um, that's been contracted as so many of our, our, other, our other traditional platforms also contract, if you're mentioning what you're writing is getting shorter and shorter. Um, yeah, so I guess that's kind of what we're here to talk about is how we, how we can deal with that as a community. Um, but kind of on that note too, I'm, I'm curious, I've heard opinions both ways on this, but um, certainly in small cities, sometimes critics here, writers, um, can be criticized for, um, for writing about their friends or writing about people they know, and there's this idea that, that criticism can come, become kind of like cultural cheerleading. So I'd love to talk about that. If people disagree or agree, I have mixed opinions, but if you guys talk first. I'll jump in then. <laughs> um, yes, boosterism is a real thing and it happens everywhere. And it's innately human nature. Um, you're going to speak more fondly about your friends and your colleagues and people that you've worked with, and that's okay. Um, but it's not okay when those are the only platforms available. So I think, um, I mean, what I can speak to, to Boston Art Review in one of our goals has been to bridge the gap between coverage and criticism by um, try, attempting to collapse some of the stylos that have been built around art writing, um, especially in Boston where we have uh, the institutions here do heavily influence the art and the writing that we do have access to see. Um, so one of the ways that that can be um, broken down is by opening up the perspectives to people beyond the title of critic or scholar or professor or academic um, into student or community or other artist or um, neighbor, I don't know, um, because there are lots of, I think there's a lot that we can learn by, by opening up writing and criticism. So with that, we'll also get to read and experience other people's art and other types of art as well, and perhaps move beyond some of that um, boosterism that's, that's spoken about. We, I have ethical guidelines that I'm supposed to follow. You know, don't write about a friend. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, wow, that's actually... Oh, yeah. I actually, I was assigned one of the Decordoba biennials because Sebastian had a friend who was showing in that exhibit. So we, we try to be really upfront and clear about who, who we know and how we know them, and the editor makes the decision. But, you know, yeah, we don't, we, we're not supposed to write about friends. And, you know, it's still, it's like I've known Randy for 20 years. It's, it's just, we don't go out for coffee. Um, but it's, I'm fond of her. <laughs> so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of gray area. But, um, you know, yeah, there are, there are a lot of really strict ethical rules. And I try, I like try never to socialize with artists. It's hard. Yeah, it's weird, but it's I try, I'm pretty good at it. I live out of state. <laughs> um, I would add also that there are not um, a, 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 an arts writing form that has been a little bit lost is the call and response between the artist and another artist, or the artist and curator. I love seeing artists interview other artists. I love seeing artists um, write from their perspective. This is gonna sound a little conservative. I do not like seeing artists as critics. Um, I, I personally think that, um, well actually no, I professionally think that um, sort of the multi-hyphenate culture <laughs> um, can water down the diverse perspectives that we need. And so I, I, I don't mean to say that I don't think artists um, shouldn't textually be critical. Indeed, they should. Um, but I do think that um, because a lot of arts writers are no longer paid, <laughs> there are fewer arts writers, there are fewer outlets, so then artists start writing about other artists because they're so desperate and it is really necessary to have um, you know, someone reviewing and writing about your work, but I think the ethical um, guidelines get thrown out the window sometimes. So if, if there are aspiring arts writers in the room, um, aspiring arts writers who are artists, I encourage you to think really carefully about what is your format. 
Um, I, some of the experiences I treasure um, as an undergrad when I was still making art was reading um, Donald Judd talk about what he was doing in his studio or talk about um, some of the collaborations or some of the frustrations that he was having. I think this is really valuable and it's really missing from the landscapes of art, from the landscape of arts writing. Um, what's not missing is I do think that there's an overabundance of artists who are writing about the exhibitions of other artists. Um, so again, that might sound a little conservative, but it is sort of my, at this moment in time, I think that it's something that should be evaluated. I was, I'm curious to see that nobody's pushing back on that. I mean, does Judd change the world by writing about the artists who he wrote about who were in this circle? So whether that was good or not, I, it is a, it's a But I question. think, I just, I'm gonna push back a little bit. A lot of that was again written from the artist's perspective as opposed to a reviewer who was going to an exhibition to review it for a publication that wasn't, wasn't a conversation among artists. That was, we're seeing a lot of, I mean, you can, leaf through our forum and the reviews in the small towns are studio artists reviewing other studio artists for our forum. Whereas Judd was really thinking carefully about his community and how they could evolve, you know, a scholarship around art that wasn't being talked about at all. So I mean I see the I see the the lines blurred there, but I think that the landscape was quite different. Could you clarify what you mean by multi-hyphenate? Do you mean like in terms of professional affiliations, or do you mean artist, like curator, <coughs> academic, sure. like everyone? Yeah. And I, I'm not, again, I'm not saying that's bad. Yeah. But I think that we're in this moment where everyone is doing so many things at once, right? Mm -hmm. Where it can be, um, you know, the lines can be blurred so much that there are no lines at all. And I think that sometimes the critical voice gets lost. Isn't it an opportunity for intersectionality though? Certainly, and I, I'm, I don't think that, what I'm saying is not an absolutist terms. Um, it's what I think at this moment in time. I, just, I really appreciate your point, Jamie, <laughs> and I think what you're getting at is just sort of being upfront about the perspective you're coming from, mm -hmm. right? And which hat you're wearing, and that we need more discourse, period. Right, and we all sort of exist in this community, and all of it's valid. And you can have a conversation with your friend who's an artist, but maybe that's a different format. And that mm -hmm. the writing and getting it out there is already significant, but it's just about being clear about what your perspective is and why, and not sort of just um, always putting on the critic's hat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just if I can continue very quickly. Uh, you know, this kind of like new uh, s state of things, I think it's also like a very fertile ground for thinking of like alternative roles or role playing within that, you know, like uh, in, in, in Colombia we suffer from boosterism too, and I have to say that I was one of the beneficiaries from it, so I didn't suffer from it, other people suffered from a <laughs> boosterism, but it was really cool because it, it proves that you can uh, be, when, when you have a professional kind of like environment, like for example with the Globe and everything in Colombia, we just started writing about our shows and our friends. And it was just because that was the, the art community, it was just like 50 people at the beginning. So we all started writing about each other and then when we realized 10 years later that basically we have written a huge chapter of Colombian art history ourselves, about ourselves, a lot of people start calling out on us and and we have all of a sudden realized that from being the underdogs we kind of like became kind of like the people that we were reacting towards when we were growing up but what was really interesting is that around that time also the internet became like super like fractured and diverse and multi-platform and there all of this really cool stuff started happening like there was this blog that was like a donkey writing reviews. And we never knew who the donkey was. I'm pretty sure I know who the person was. I'm pretty sure that I've, like, I've shared drinks with this person because the person writing the blog knew a lot about us and our work. But they took this kind of like persona of a donkey going to contemporary art exhibitions to write really scathing reviews of our work. And they were really well because they totally cracked open the very hermetic type of scene that we had created for ourselves. 
And I think there's so much, like with the internet, there's so much room for being playful about this. And I think that's the one thing that for me is so, still very surprising about being in Boston, like not to, to see so many young people, but at the same time, I think there's this hyper-professionalization of the like artists. Act, like you have to wear all the hats, but all the hats are within one umbrella, like a personal umbrella, rather than somehow creating some type of mistake and playing with roles or collectives. You know, like there's so many ways of like distributing critique that could be explored. That for me, it's surprising that this this type of stuff doesn't happen here. And I was sharing with Leah these uh, two things that I'm super interested in. One of them is called Kirat, that some of you have probably seen. Is this new like video blog by uh, two um, Dutch critics? That it's Kirat spells keeping it real. Our critics. And they go with a camera and some like uh, headsets, microphones, and they just like go after like really, really big like powerhouses. Mm -hmm. they, there's an episode in which they make a gallery director from LA cry and an art fair. <laughs> They're awful, but it's just yeah. it's just interesting to see that there's a space for that and that we're working with a space in a space that is highly <coughs> playful and that we should celebrate that we are within that space and that all that stuff like can happen and. And I think the internet also creates something that you were asking at the beginning, that is kind of like this, or not only the internet, but like expanded forms of writing can create interesting kind of like alternative narratives and storytelling. So for example, with your ad, it's like an episode thing on, on YouTube, so you wait for the next episode. It starts kind of like weaving out these narratives of like, where are they going next? And it's, they went to like Documenta, and they, they went to the Venice Biennial, so you were kind of like following them. Mm -hmm how they were like destroying people left and right. And there was also, some of you also might be familiar with Hennessy Youngman. This, like, he had like a, a show on YouTube called Art Thoughts. And it was like this kind of like hip hop art critic mm -hmm. that, that was like taking on like, like a series of like subjects <laughs> in art, like relational aesthetics, performance art, but it was all through like a very humoristic and like playful approach to that. So I think like role playing and like being also as imaginative and creative as possible with the ways that the internet can somehow obscure identities, create new identities or create new intersectional roles that somehow just live within an artificial realm as the internet. I think that's like there's so much room for that right now that I really hope that somehow it gets exploited. Do people have questions? Yes. So, one of my words that I want to know that uh, the art writing is very important and that there should be more of it, or at least a lot of it. Um, I'm wondering why. Um, so, I can see why it's good for the ecosystem of artists and galleries and things like that, but why is it good for Boston? So, like, why, how would it, good uh, why is it good for Boston? Yeah, why would, how would the community be a better place for people to live uh, if there were more? I don't, you know, obviously art writing or more criticism isn't putting food on anyone's table, sure. you know, it's not saving, um, saving lives. I do think that it creates, um, I think in my experience it creates a common, um, you know, it creates a place for us all to come to. It, it, does, it does put things on an even playing field, so to speak. Um, I also think that, as we were talking about before, art writing really gives um, a lot of different points of entry to an artwork, um, and I think having more critics um, and having more diverse um, critical voices adds to um, more points of entry to an artwork. If anyone else wants to respond. Um, yeah, I, I agree, and um, artists need certain things to be able to produce work, and we know as audience members and people who appreciate and enjoy interacting with art that art is vital to the community. So if we back it up further, um, there are things that artists need to survive. They need a place to work, they need a place to show, and they need dialogue. And when the dialogue is missing, they're going to move to a place that does provide it. So in our city, um, we see a lot of young, brilliant, <laughs> wonderful artists that do what they need to do in Boston, and when it doesn't continue to give them what they need or what they're looking for, they leave, and they go to other cities that do provide that. And so by welcoming more conversation and more discourse around the events, the ideas, the things that are being produced, then perhaps people will, will stay. 
and will continue to, to be a part of that community and develop with it. Did anyone read the NEA study that came out recently? Does anyone? So the NEA did a survey and an analysis of economies in the United States, um, urban economies, and last year, as many people went to museums and galleries as went to the movies. And I think that if you asked someone on the street, you know, were the, were the films that were coming out as important as the art, as the visual art, or the performing arts that are coming out, whether they would be up front and say it or not, they would probably say film is more important to them. And if you think about the robust written culture around film, um, I think about um, Moonlight winning the Best Picture last year. Um, that, that film probably wouldn't have been seen if it were not for critics, if it were not for writing. And so I really try to, um, I mean, my, my graduate work is in comparative <coughs> arts, so I really try to make, to draw comparisons between the visual and performing arts with um, film, because film is such a huge part of American culture. So if you can think about creating um, this really rich, thick, written culture around visual art, I think that it will do something. Um, I think, I mean, maybe I'm a little um, romantic about it, but I do think that if we could grow arts writing, um, contemporary art could, could and would be as important to American society as contemporary film is. I think in, uh, sorry, but in, in a newspaper, the movie reviews are given more space sure than art reviews, and that's, I know I don't know technically if this is written anywhere, but I, it seems to me that's because they're buying ads. Probably, yeah. And so buying ads makes space for the film reviews, mm -hmm. and the, you know, the, the galleries, art museums buy ads, but there aren't as many art museums in Boston as there are movies out. Um, so, do you think of it as a chicken and an egg problem, though? If there were, for instance, the Phoenix had a sister publication in Kansas City, where I lived and worked, and it's called The Pitch, and most of their writing is on the visual arts, because the community got used to reading it. They actually wow. downsized the film reviews to include more visual arts reviews, <coughs> right? That's unheard of. <laughs> <laughs> and then there were more ads, there were more galleries. I don't. If, no one's been to Kansas City. It's a great place. They have a great art scene, and they have. Um, so the pitch, when the parent company tried to close it, the city lost their mind, and so a group of cultural um, types, artists, philanthropists, they bought the pitch from its parent company, and now they run it, and it has robust reviews in it. So while I, I wholeheartedly agree with you, I do wonder if the, if the model, if somebody could get enough le leverage, if the model couldn't be tweaked. Would you mind if I jump in for a second? Sure, I think there's a question over oh, here too. Um, this is base start as a break, but I promise it isn't. Um, so I curated a show in this room with Randy uh, in October. Uh, it was Andy Liu's show, that was very long. And uh, it was between, it was the run of the mill, so it was very short, but we didn't get anything. We didn't, we didn't get covered, right? We didn't, no one wrote about it. Turned out that like, somebody's made right their dissertation on it, which is really encouraging. But I'm wondering, given that we think that the, the economies of art, art writing is not gonna change anytime soon, I kind of respond to those sort of wands and approach, like can the internet solve this? Could we have like a bat signal that goes out when that when you know it's a, an exhibition is up to encourage whether it be artists uh, like I think more is more when it comes to art writing. So I guess I'm I'm wondering whether we could do something to get uh, just more people covering the shows. And I don't just structurally do we have bloggers openings or something like that to get people come to come in because I do think I think the artists are missing out and we're missing out um, and it could totally be addressed. And Randy and I sort of were like. Maybe we sent out a press release too late, maybe it's a funny time of year, but like if a place like this can't get a show covered, like what's that alternative space in Austin going yeah. to Can I respond to that even though 
I really wanted to cover that, so that's part of why I wanted to cover it. Um, <laughs> so it's your fault. Well, I mean, basically, I, I get like so. I have so many questions. Really I don't. I write for like three or four places, and I don't. I can't do it regularly enough because I. It takes. I'm sorry. Could you tell us who you are? And My name's Heather. And, and, and where you write. For I write for like. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Really matter. Really matter. Yeah. And, it, and it doesn't matter exactly. I only have time to write like four pieces a year, basically, because it's it pays so little. So I spend like twelve hours writing one piece, and I get paid like nothing. <laughs> you know. So, but the point is is more just that like sometimes I get so many press releases and they're so physically large, like files, that I actually can't get to my email. My email shuts down. And that was one that I knew about it, but then I was like, looking for the date, and then my email crashed because I had so many questions. But, but, but it's not, not you. Like I really no, no, but, two but people I think, like it, three people like it. No, no, but I think like the fine. answer. I do have an answer because okay. I came up with an answer to that problem, yeah. which is that what you can do sometimes is tell the long story. So like you can't necessarily get people to that one day thing, but you can tell the long story about. Um, this problem, for example, like that, that things have to happen on such a, a short time span. And then in doing that, you can sort of reflect back on what happened. It doesn't help with like, getting people there, but it does help tell the larger story, which like eventually might um, build an understanding of why the press is valuable. It's a slow, slow process. Can I say that from like a publishing standpoint and like editorial standpoint, we want writers. Like people don't pitch us things. And then if they do, <laughs> I understand, like everyone, anyone who's writing for us basically has two, three jobs. And so Who are you in? I'm the managing editor of The Great Enchantment. Oh, okay. So, so uh, I pitch something to you. Please, please. <laughs> we we want to work with yeah. people. We want to cover everything, but we are yeah. limited partially because we're all, do you we're all, pay? Oh, no, we're all, well, we are writers, yeah, but okay, we, we're all volunteers, writers. so we're also limited by how much time we can give to our writers in the publication. Mm -hmm. And that's something we also want to grow. And I'm sure there are other, like, so the internet helps, I think, but it's limited by um, people maybe not feeling like there's, it, that it's accessible for them. I, I feel like there are people who say to me that they would like to write, but they didn't know that they could submit. Even though, you know, we have, we put out calls for this and sometimes it's just hard to find in like the cacophony of the art scene. But also, but, I mean, like I've been an artist in this town for, I don't know, over 20 years now. No one's ever written anything about any of my work. So it's also, we should, the expectation, I mean, I've never had a piece of press, which is fine. You know? This would be an awesome format for an artist to interview or write right. about which I've done. I've actually done in that. a yeah. studio setting. Like, these are things that the landscape desperately needs. Yeah, and I've done tours like, with artists of other artists' shows. So you start to hear more of the voices. But, I mean, we have to find ways to get more voices into each story, is what I'm trying to say. Like, so I find it really more. interesting that everyone here, just about everyone here is a writer, and I want to know who you think your audience is. How big, who's reading this? And there are so many platforms, you know, who's the editor? It's sort of like as a consumer of writing, how many blogs do I need to follow? Who's, who's good? You know, the old, the New York Times has editors. So I know that my time reading, is that an issue for writers? Well, I think that is a really good point, and you said that that's a single signal. Like, if there was a kind of collaborative place where everything came together and it was probably like that, that might be a, a good starting point. But I, um, I moved to Boston for five years. I moved away for three years. I just came back and started writing reviews, and I've been having a lot of trouble. Like, I'm not in the scene really. I have so much trouble finding things to review. Um, I was shocked there was not really a comprehensive listing of gallery shows. I think Boston Art Review is working on this, right? Or trying. Okay, yes, <laughs> I know it's hard. We need to be helped. Yeah. Help us. Part of, yeah, part of the problem is that it's it's such a complicated right. system and there are so many places here. So if you do like a submission based thing, then you're you're like relying on the people submitting to like yeah, then I make it understandable, it. yeah. And fact check. And, and fact, fact check and all these other things. And then, but there's also, I think it's hard for us to find even coders who can actually figure out how to do it, because I don't know how to do it. I would love to make that happen, but I'm limited by the technology that I have access to, and also how much money we have, which is nothing. Like, we don't have money, and most places don't. 
So, so I think it's partially about we need to make connections with other communities so that we can get your data. But I completely agree. I mean, it's very frustrating that there isn't anything. And it's not, it's also the things that we do have aren't accessible. I feel like we're talking around the idea of capitalism, but not seeing it right now. <laughs> um, and I know that we're like in white walls and we're in the South End and we all accept this to an extraordinary extent. But um, if we're talking about what can arts writing do, right? Like why is it important? Why does it matter? Then one thing that it can do is it can exist outside of the commercial system. We're not selling, galleries are important, museums are important, but people who are writing art reviews aren't writing it to sell art. And I think that's an important distinction. And also, there are ways to be radical about how you do that. One thing that Jameson and, and I are trying to do at Boston Art Review is to have a magazine, an art magazine that has no ads. And that is going to be, that will be a challenge. And whether or not we can, I mean, we will rise to the occasion. But um, getting the buy-in from the community, like if you all say that you want to see reviews and you want to see listings, like, I, publications. Yeah, we need, we, need, we need folks to put their money where their mouth is, because we want to print copies. And right now, we're going to have 500, and then that's going to be the end. So um, I think buy-in from the community, like theoretically and actually, um, because we also want to be able to compensate folks for labor according to <coughs> wage standards. Um, so. I think also all our organizations, like we want help. <laughs> yeah. We really want help, and we, partially we don't know who to ask. Yes. So, like, so like please just come, like, we come to us. Like come to any small organization that you may have an interest in. The way in is just like sending an email. Yeah. Because I can guarantee someone will feel relief that you're interested. Yes. I'm sorry, if um, we're operating outside the market, so my question is, galleries have photocopies of every critic that has written on the artist as the first thing you see when you walk in, why do option catalogs have a list of all the reviews that have been right about the price? Why are, why are checklists next to press releases? Is that the question? Or next to reviews? No, 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 sorry. I'll be more explicit instead of asking rhetorical questions. Um, yes. isn't, isn't the sort of, isn't one of the things that art writer does besides contributing to the historical record contribute to the market value of the art that's being written about? It, it can, yeah, of course. And, but, yes. Mm -hmm. And how does it bolster an artist's career? How do you define the value of an artist's career? Is it if they're selling work? Is it if people know about their work? Is it if they're a part of a collective or a community? So yes, I think yes, you can, yes. right, yeah, so we can. All of those things, I just don't think that we wash we our hands of. Of course, the, we exist in capitalism, of, of, of course. Right. Yeah, I mean, and we're not trying to make a zine either. Like there are, there are, there's a spectrum and there's room for everyone to do, the, to make the thing that they believe in. And so, yeah. If, so do it, I guess, or help us. Do you know Greg Cook? I think so. He's writing a newsletter, and um, you can subscribe to it to support his, his writing. Um, Wonderland. You know, yeah. Wonderland. Wonderland, right. So that's one model. And um, yeah. Has everyone seen the film Pollock? <laughs> yes. Put yes. your hands up. So what I wanted to share with you is the power of the word. The power and that film, it starts with this. It starts with this. And and it starts with this in discussion of the words and how the words change lives, how the words all the discussion that's been raised here. But it, it, it also is a film that brought to life the film did, for me. The sense of how the art was discussed in a way in which it was carried forward in the film. So this idea of meshing the two, the art, film, and I, I sort of take sort of umbrage with regard to uh, film is another way, it's art. So this whole sense of how we look at what this represents now some 70 years later, and there's a power, this tremendous power here, that I'm holding my hands. And I embrace it in the way in which the words here change lives. And it's, it's an astounding thing. And to have this copy that I own, it's, it's like a, a piece of reality that is, just goes beyond. So I know that reviews, you will get your reviews. The point is, the point is that that words are very powerful, and they do change lives, and it's important to understand. But as I stand here now, where am I? 
How am I being represented? I mean, I, I had a wonderful exhibition. Are you an artist or a writer? I'm all of that. You're so, and I, and I, I, I think that's important to be all of that because it has to do something with, uh, in other words, agency. Yes. I mean, I'm not sure any of you have agency with regard to how that all functions. Why? Because I feel as though I'm someone who's been here all of my life. Someone who comes in here from Columbia, do you have the agency? So I'm not, I'm not, I'm just asking the question. All right. Well, but also we're anthropologists of this community. And that's what I, that's the part that's important to me is that the whole picture of what this community is be captured in, in a linear way. And I'm, I, you know, I mean, it's, I feel like that function of getting people to things should almost be separated out. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. and, and I think about how the music scene does it. And there's all these like international networks that just, you, you know, you can all the bands plug in their information and you can just track what you can search on whatever keyword you want and you can track them. I'm sure that we could, it's commercial software, but there's enough smart people in this country who could figure out how to make the same system work for artists and they just plug in their information and you just follow whatever they want to follow, you know? But, um, but I feel like getting people to things is one thing, but capturing and documenting. So just, so just what's very quickly, the question asks, is he the, is he the greatest living painter in the United States? No. <laughs> so, so you see how involved it is. So, 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 so I, I thank you. Yeah, I think thank you all for being here so much. I think it's probably close to eight o'clock. It's seven twenty. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I can start. I mean, for for Baker and Shiny, um, and this question, someone asked this question uh, before a little, a little bit about who we're writing for. I think we, we really are writing for um, first and foremost artists in the city. Um, and Brian, we say you can disagree, but um, I, when I'm writing for Baker and Shiny, I do feel like I'm writing for artists in the city. Uh, and then for the Grid, which is the project um, that I uh, launched with Lindsay people to Corey Oakenrander from now live in Atlanta, um, we are really writing about, uh, we're, I think we're doing the same thing but in different communities, and I think the difference there is that we're really interested in um, writing about artist-run spaces and, and really talking to people that are our organizers um, as opposed to um, people in museums or people at, at larger institutions? No, for me it's different or difficult because as an artist you kind of like try to trick yourself to think that you're not considering an, an audience when you're making work. But at least I try to do that, like I try to think that this, I'm only doing this for myself. And, but I think it's, that of course is not true and, I, and it's difficult for me because I, I, most of my work has been showcased in Colombia and Latin America and now in the United States so I kind of like deal with these two different audiences that have like linguistic barriers and stuff like that, cultural barriers and, but I think it's a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a great part of the challenge of being an artist to consider what type of like audience you're creating with like the momentary kind of like situations that you get to orchestrate when you have an exhibition and that is not a, for me that is not like a demographic that could be targeted as easier if it was, if I was running like a long-standing uh, publication for example, it's something that just like permeates that moment in time in that in space for that specific <laughs> space so I think with with distillery it was interesting working with, with with the distillery gallery because it definitely replicated a lot of like the modes of operation in which the galleries that I work with in Latin America operate. And then by doing so, I realized that there's some kind of like coincidence and uh, commonalities between audiences that I still haven't been able to pinpoint exactly what type of like, audience 
am I talking to? But definitely when you're making art, I don't know, I think for me, when it's kind of like magicians doing tricks for other magicians, you know, like, of course you would like your work to be like uh, reaching out to people who are not interested in art or contemporary art at all. But you definitely are, all, for, at least for me, I'm always editing myself from the perspective of somebody who's savvy within our medium and within our scene and that imaginary person or that imaginary judge is my primary audience which is like a more annoying person of myself I think <laughs> <laughs> that's the person that I'm making work for and then after that anyone who comes in contact with the work it's it's a, it's, it's a luxury so yeah um when I'm writing about an artist, uh, particularly related to an exhibition, um, I think of my text as um, a more mainstream piece of scholarship. Uh, so I work really hard. I, I actually sort of imagine who my audience member is, and it's usually a freshman or sophomore in college. Um, somebody who's not necessarily an art expert, but has had a little bit of exposure to art, meaning they took a high school art class, or they've been to a museum before, but they're not necessarily an expert. So I try to, um, I mean, just to get to the nuts and bolts of it, when I'm writing, I really try to break down the artwork um, in an educational way, but then I try to build a context um, relating to either um, some other culture, some other um, some other culture I use that really broadly, like whether that's the culture of Boston or the you know um, an international culture. And then I also try to just throw in a little bit of. Um, theory or something that is sort of a, a siloed element of being a contemporary art worker. Um, I think that these are really important things and I do that not necessarily because artists are my audience but because artists are the people that I'm serving so I can best serve my audience by serving the artist I'm working with. Um, and then when I'm writing um, for when I'm writing criticism, I, I look at the magazine or the publication or the website's uh, mission statement and I write for who, that's something we haven't really brought up here, is this idea of a mission statement and a mission statement is an, is an umbrella for how you operate as a writer. So um, I, I try to think really carefully. I, I currently write for Art in America every so often and Art in America is writing for um, the quote unquote art world. So I can be, um, so there I'm a, you know, a bit more, I'm, a, I'm less explanatory and more theoretical, I guess you could say. I wanna come back to this idea of artists writing um, because I do think that um, artists can identify an audience that's really specific to um, the, artist, the audience that they want to engage, whereas us critics and curators, because we're working under that umbrella of the mission statement of the organization or the publication, we don't have that same freedom um, and we don't have the ability to be so playful with format. And I, I personally think that's necessary. I think that some boundaries are helpful. Um, but I, so audience is something that the writer doesn't necessarily always define. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, when I was working at the Rizzi Museum, about um, halfway into my tenure there, um, this, the director of the museum approached me and actually called me to his office and, and indicated that my writing that I had been doing, uh, I, had a, I had my own column, and I wrote uh, sometimes in uh, Providence and sometimes in another, another community, so I have this ongoing column that my writing may be misinterpreted as being representative of the museum's perspective. Mm -hmm. Do any of you have those kind of experiences in terms of the ethics of writing? Just... I don't work for a large enough institution, so I'm usually trying. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, going back to like the Friends Writing for Friends thing, a big yeah. question, and we have a, I wouldn't say it's a policy, but it's, and it's an understanding that we don't, if you're an artist, we don't write about your show, if you're having a show, or um, we don't write about shows that we um, curate or, or work on in any regard. Um, but 
Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to, I mean, just talking about that generally, I, as an editor, tend to really trust the people that are writing with me, and I have um, a lot of email exchange and correspondence, or maybe even like meet them in person, which is great if everyone has time. Uh, but I tend to, to really trust them, and if they're, they tell me that they can be really objective and they have this um, great perspective to bring to their, their friend's work, then I trust that, and if we get the draft and it's, it's basically like a press release about how great their friend is, then that's a different story. But that typically doesn't happen. Um, I've, I've had good luck so far with people writing about um, people's work, uh, people who they know's work in a really meaningful way. Um, in fact, Juan and I live down the hall from each other, <laughs> and um, I love to write about this show, Full Collapse, at the distillery, but I do think it's more, like, it feels more comfortable to me as, like, an interview between us versus, like, a review of that show, because, I don't know, we live next to each other. But, yeah. I wanted to touch back on um, audience and platforms, because one of the goals for Boston Art Review has really been to provide um, a lot of accessible points for engaging with the publication at large. And I, we throw around the word of accessibility a lot everywhere, um, in the bathrooms and museums and writing and everywhere. And um, I think part of being accessible is both meeting people where they are, but also pulling them towards you. And one way that we've tried to do this is to offer lots of platforms for engagement. So while we exist online and we publish video content, interviews, and reviews on our online platform, we also have an Instagram that functions entirely differently and publishes weekly guides of what to see and is more of a tool. And then with having the print publication, it's more of this um, piece of literature to indulge in that has artist essays and interviews and profiles and features. And between each of those three platforms, I think just about everyone in this room could find a way that they want to engage. Um, and I think that's really important because it gives agency over the audience as to what they want to take and what they want to see and what they want to read about and puts a lot of power um, back into the audience. Can I just, I, I just want to say that my readers are, are not necessarily artists, that, that my readers are ne not necessarily part of the art world. And I think it's important, I mean, part of the reason that I write art criticism is so that I can represent what I'm seeing to people who are not necessarily going to be in this room. Um, and so we have, at the Globe, we have this idea of the Globe reader. And that you know that person is a particular demographic at this point. Um, but and so if I wanted to invite more readers, I would say more young people. But uh, I, I think that there's a real advantage to having to write to, for a general audience because it, I mean I, I jargon free is is what we're looking for. And I, I remember in college, I did not study art. I studied anthropology, and I was. No, the jargon is just awful, awful, awful. I don't want jargon in my life. I wanted to be a writer, no jargon. And um, I think that I still practice that. And it's in part because it, I have to be able to translate stuff that can be very highly theoretical to people who are not really interested in theory at all. And um, so that's what art writing can do for Boston. Um, it's, it's not just about the art world, it's not just about the artists and servicing the artists, it's about the whole community of people who might be interested in getting engaged with art but not know how to do it. <laughs>